This is the second Sunday in the season of Lent. And our lessons for this morning describe for us our interaction with God. It's one thing to have a cognitive belief about God, but to believe in God is something else again, because that includes trust. That speaks to relationship. And we hear that in our first lesson for this morning. It's the story of a man named Abram, who may have been a merchant and therefore a traveler used to the trade routes of the Mesopotamian era, a couple of thousand years before Jesus. We know that in biblical times, there were many, many local gods. The god of the tree, the god of the lake, the god of the river, the god of the sun, moon, and stars. But their power was localized. If you went outside of that territory, you were no longer under the authority of those local gods. Now instead you come under the authority of the gods in the locality where you are. I have no doubt that Abram had a number of gods, just like all his family members and all his neighbors did. But in our passage for this morning, another god speaks to him and makes a very bizarre request. And Abram says, okay. And he does. From the book of beginnings, Genesis, chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And here we have our beginnings. The beginnings of our Christian faith. The beginning of the Jewish faith. And in fact, the beginning of Islam. Because all three religions trace their roots back to this moment when God called to Abram and prepared to establish a covenant with him. Psalm 121 was well suited to help ancient travelers cope with the threats they faced during their travel. It's a very familiar psalm and it speaks in a way that's a little strange to people today. Remember last week we talked about the, the connection between mountaintops and God. It was on a mountaintop that Elijah and Moses appeared to Jesus. It was on a mountaintop when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses. It was on a mountaintop when the prophet Elijah heard that still, small voice. So it would not be uncommon for someone who was looking for God to look to the mountains. In Psalm 121, we discover that God is not just in the hills, but everywhere. And that's a powerful comfort to people as they journey through life. Let's turn to page 279 in the front of the hymnals. And we'll read Psalm 121, and let's read it together in unison. I lift my eyes up to the hills, from, from where, where is my help to come? come. My, my help comes, comes from the Lord, the, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved, and he who watches over you will not sleep. Behold, he who keeps watch over Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. 
The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand, so that the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. It is he who shall keep you safe. The Lord shall watch over your going out and your coming in from this time forth forevermore. One of my favorite books in the Bible is Paul's letter to the Romans. Maybe because I'm a teacher, I just like the way Paul lays it all out for us. And one step leading to the next describes for us the nature of our salvation. Now, if you would, picture a triangle with faith at the top, righteousness, and faithfulness, in other words, behavior, at the bottom. For the Jewish people, righteousness was based on performance and behavior. If you obeyed the law, then you would be considered righteous. But unfortunately, none were, because none could keep the law. Paul comes along and delivers his gospel message based on the gift of Jesus Christ, which we receive through faith. And it is based on our faith in God that God declares us to be righteous. So we're not righteous because we do good deeds. We do good deeds because we're righteous and we want to praise and serve God. And in this passage we have this morning, Paul looks right back to that first lesson we read and holds Abraham or Abram up to us as someone who believed God and was faithful to him. From Paul's letter to the Romans, verses 1 through 5 and then 13 through 17. St. Paul writes, what are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that the world, that he would inherit the world, did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherence of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Here ends our second lesson. What can we say about the third chapter of John that has not already been said? The 16th verse here is one of the most popular in all the world. I was even noticing it last night in one of the World Baseball Classic games where the commentators were talking about the fact that everybody was excited and standing up. Even the two guys with the John 316 wigs. <laughs> because if you've ever watched sporting events, there's always one or two people within camera view sometimes wearing clown wigs, I don't know why, holding up signs that say, John 3, 16. Mm. 
Jesus had just finished performing his first miracle. At the wedding of Cana, he converted water into some of the sweetest wine the people at that party had ever tasted. And John tells us at the end of that section that this is being recorded as the first of many things that Jesus did, as if these miracles are proof that Jesus is someone special. And then there's Nicodemus, teacher of the law, so a man very familiar with our Old Testament, his Bible. And he has become aware of Jesus and the marvelous, miraculous things he has done. And so he wants to come and talk to him about this. And Jesus says some very strange things to him. He says, first of all, you must be born again from on high. In other words, you were born once physically. Now you must be born again spiritually. I would suspect that Nicodemus was not the brightest crayon in the box. <laughs> because he doesn't get it. And he questions Jesus how it's possible to go back and re-enter his mother's womb now that he's an adult. And Jesus even teases him about it. So, you're a teacher of the law, and you can't figure this out, the things that a common peasant preacher is saying? And then he goes on to tell Nicodemus that our relationship with God is not based on law, but on love. God's love for us was so profound that he was willing to offer himself up for us as the payment for our sins, with the result that anyone who has faith will be saved. We rise at the good news of the gospel. This is the gospel according to John, the third chapter, beginning at the first verse. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, uh, How can anybody be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you not a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. As we seated, and we'll sing hymn number 320. 